Hey, David Rathoff here. Um, hope you're having a good day. Uh, apologies for the beanie and the scruffy beard. Uh, it's a fall morning. I am uh, <laughs> just got the kids ready and I'm uh, trying to make an Elixir video here. So uh, yeah, I thought I would share something I was working on recently in Elixir that would be of interest. Um, one of the problems you'll, or I have a lot when I'm working on an app, it's a pretty common problem, is um, early on you might have a bunch of things and you're not sure if they're like the same object or really different objects. And um, you can't, you're kind of doing a dance for a while where you don't want to um, commit yourself to uh, a decision to make them like exactly the same because um, you, you don't really know yet if they are. And the reason it's tricky is because uh, what will happen is you'll end up you can end up like duplicating code for each of those items or for things that handle each of those items. Um, and that's just makes programs like harder to maintain. So uh, one way you can get around some of that stuff is by doing um, what in the Ruby world at least is referred to as like metaprogramming. Um, I've heard it referred to as like macro programming as well. And, um, Anyway, I had a bunch of similar code in my application for handling events for these different kinds of objects, and I was curious um, how you would go about doing this in Elixir, because um, I'd never tried it before in Elixir. So um, yeah, I just wanted to walk through um, how why I'm using it, and then um, just show you what that um, cleanup looks like. And if you haven't done this before, it's important to keep in mind um, you need to be careful when you do this kind of thing, because generally... The way you do it is you allow your um, you write a program that can like programmatically call um, different methods on different objects, and so you have to be really careful that you don't um, have security holes where you're allowing like user entered strings or strings from a database or some source that you don't control um, to get arbitrarily executed. And uh, I'll show you in my application like where. Uh, what I've done about that and what I should still do that I have not done yet, just because this is kind of a spike to see how it works. So I'm making a financial planning tool. So you can see this chart here. So I have a lot of things that are conceptually very, um, conceptually different, but like when you think about them, they're really very similar. Like they, um, the data that backs them is very similar. Just the behaviors are uh, different. So uh, I need to track assets. Um, so those have like an ID, a name. Um, they have a date that you acquire them, maybe a date that you get rid of them, and then an amount. Um, and there's other things that could be attached, like a, a rate of appreciation or something like that. Um, but if you think about other things that you would consider in your finances, so like expenses, um, purchases, payments, uh, investments, they all have basically the same data uh, associated with them. Um, you know, they all have an ID, they all have a name, they all have an amount, they all have a date or a range of dates on which they're going to occur. Um, so if, um, for the meantime, I want to give myself maximum flexibility, um, but I also want to make sure I'm not just repeating work all over the place. And I was kind of getting into that pattern of repeating stuff. So um, anyway, I'll just show you quickly what I did about that. So I'm going to scroll up to the top of this. The way I'm going to do this is by going through a, um, just a, a diff of the uh, commit. Um, it might seem a little weird at first, but I think it'll be pretty straightforward. <laughs> so um, what I'll start out with is... Actually, let me do... This is asset. I'm going to go down to um, expense because I think it'll be a little more useful. So... Okay, yeah, here we go. Um, well, actually, that's not going to be... Let's start here. Let's just start with asset. So um, for all of these items, I basically have like a new slash add where I want to be able through the UI to like um, create a new form where I can enter information about an asset. And when I do that, I want to get whatever like the ideas that I should use for this new asset. Um, I want to create a um, struct for that kind of object. So in this case, it's an asset. And then um, I wanna take the existing list of ass assets that I have off of the socket.assigns. And I wanna put that, 
I want to make a new list that includes this new item, and then I want to assign that. Um, I want to. Sorry, I gotta be careful about how I say this. I want to make a new socket <laughs> where I um, take the old socket, but assign the um, new list of items. So you're never you're always getting new objects. That's what makes this a little uh, tricky to talk about. And then I need to um, send a response back using that new socket. And um, this is also just a little helper function that I have. Um, so the thing you'll notice here is I took all that code and just simplified it down um, to this function call. So I can call add item. I can say it, I need the socket. The um, atom for the property on the socket assigns that I care about in this case is assets. Uh, you can see that from here. <clears throat> and then the kind of asset I'm going to be creating, um, so this is the struct or the, the module for the struct, is asset. And then similarly, so yeah, I mean, all this code here just boil down, boils down to calling um, this function here. And the nice thing about this is I can now call add item and all I have to do is change the property on the socket I want to assign to and the um, the struct or the module that I want to use for this specific item. Um, and then you can see here, I'm doing the same, a similar pattern for um, updating an asset. So the conceptually the pattern there is you get an item, it's got a bunch of new values you want to use those values to create um, a new struct and you want to include that in the list that's assigned on the socket. So I've tried to boil it down to be as um, simple as possible based on uh, like have the code be as simple as the concept should be. Um, so here, I was like previously what I was doing was for each individual um, property that I cared about, I was reading in the string property from the item that was passed in. Um, so that's like from the form, from the web form. And then casting it to whatever type I'm interested in. So um, ID, float, integer. Uh, these are all just like little custom helpers I have um, for uh, converting types. And then uh, what I was doing was I was creating a new struct using all those values. And then I was um, building up a new list of those items and um, using the existing assets plus this new item and then creating a new socket where the new items were assigned on that socket and then giving a response with that socket. Um, but you can see here, it's just boiled down to um, this map for the attributes, which is just each attribute and then each um, helper I wanna use for like casting the value to whatever I want it to be or converting into whatever I want it to be. And then calling update items with the socket, the property on the socket, the struct or module, um, that this map of attributes from above, and then the item. And this thing can do all the work given those inputs. And then similarly for delete, if I can find it, let me find an example <coughs> of delete real quick. Uh, sometimes the the way things shake out in these diffs is um, a little goofy. I wish I could do a side by side diff here, but um, anyway, here's uh, an example of deleting an expense. <laughs> so conceptually, it's just take whatever was uh, passed in from the web UI, grab the ID, convert it to an ID, um, generate a new list um, for the given um, assigns and struct that just excludes, that rejects that um, the item with that ID. So in this case, we're rejecting an expense um, with that ID. And this is just another, I'll reject by ID is just another little helper that um, I made, but you can, you can basically do like an enum filter to do that. And then yeah, once you basically create a new socket with the new values and then uh, send a response with the new socket. So here you can see I was able to simplify all that down to just delete item on the socket for the given um, atom, uh, the given assigns property, and then whatever the new item 
is that was or whatever the item is that was passed in as part of the event. So yeah, I mean it's not it's not a huge savings, but you can see here it's um, you know four lines of code basically get knocked down to one line of code. But the nice the really nice thing about it is I can do this consistently across any kind of item. Um, so you know it's for it's uh, saving me what four lines of code times however many items I have or however many types of items I have. Um, so here you can see like for the rest of this PR, most of this is just red um, deletions and then calling these little helpers that I've got set up. And then, so you're probably wondering um, how these helpers work if you're not um, familiar with this like I was not. So if we go down a little bit further, yeah, here's where I start um, to introduce these things. Um, so here's add item, and this just takes the socket, the property on the socket we're gonna be working with, and then the module. Um, this is like, you can think of it as the module or the struct that you're gonna be building. So using um, map.get, we can programmatically get a uh, property off of uh, socket.assigns. So in, this might be, for example, like the assets atom passed in. And that will give us the, the list of items we're working with. And then again, similar to how we saw before, we're just going to get the greatest ID off of the uh, existing items and then add one to it. Uh, on this next line, you can see um, if we want to programmatically build a struct, we can call struct with the um, module. So I have like an asset module, for example, and then you pass in whatever properties you want to set. So in the in this case, I'm only setting the ID and then I'm just using the default properties from the uh, uh, module that makes that struct. And then again, just um, getting a new list that is the previous list of items with the new item uh, on the front of the list. Whoop. And then um, just um, at the end here, assigning, so you can call it assign on socket with the property with uh, the new value. So this is how you programmatically set a property. Um, but this is pretty cool. Like now we can just programmatically add items for any kind of item. Um, and the thing that makes this relatively safe in this arrangement is I'm always um, uh, deciding what the property and modules are. Um, so like, for example, uh, what is this one, add item? Um, you can see here, yeah. So I'm always choosing what gets passed in here. So I'm choosing purchases and I'm choosing purchase. Um, so that's a lot safer than, for example, if somehow we were getting user input or data from the database and using that to call these methods, like that would really open you up for um, different kinds of attacks because then people could just pass in arbitrary strings and try to hit different things in your system, different modules and different um, functions. Um, so that would be bad. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, this still isn't um, as safe as it should be. So what I should do is I should make a list of whitelisted pro um, properties on the socket and a whitelisted uh, list of the allowable modules to call or even the combinations. Like I might want to say for each module, here are the things um, that you're allowed to call. But basically the idea is just to um, make a, a permitted list or whitelist or whatever. And then... Um, Check, check before you do these calls um, like this to make sure that the, the things you're calling are allowed to be called. And that gives you a lot more safety because it reduces the chance that um, you'll either get, um, you, you, you know, somebody will mistakenly take user input or values from a database or some source you don't control and execute those. Um, it'll also do things like prevent yourself from making a dumb mistake and calling it with something you shouldn't call it with. 
Um, and if you're working in a team, somebody could innocently, you know, start using this in a way you're not anticipating and try to call it with something you don't uh, want them to call it with. Um, so like, even if you wrote this as it is now, um, like, so say I just check this in. If at some point I started working with other people, even though I know this is safe, like either I could come in and screw it up <laughs> or somebody else who didn't write this could come in and like, uh, accidentally pass along a user input for one of these values somehow, and then and then it would be very insecure. So, um, yeah. So you just need to be really careful when you go about doing meta programming and make sure that you're doing it in a secure way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll probably make another pass um, at some point to make all these things uh, whitelisted. But yeah, uh, I thought I would just share kind of my first. Um, adventure into doing a little bit of this like macro or uh, meta programming in elixir i don't know what it's called i'm sure there's a name for it in elixir um but yeah it's been really cool because um it's going to make it a lot easier for to, for me to maintain these things it was getting annoying each time i wanted to make a change to go and have to go in and do it in like you know five places or however many you know however many items i had i had to at least change it that many times if not two times that or three times that. Um, so yeah, hope this was helpful. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them on the video. Um, yeah, if you've done something like this and you have good examples of like better ways to do it, I'd uh, love to hear about that. I'm still, you know, relatively new to Elixir. So always, uh, always looking for better ways to do things. But uh, anyway, yeah, hope you have a good day and a good Halloween and I will uh, see you in the next video.